I'm sorry. I am so sorry, but you're so stupid. You have no idea, and you're the only one who has no idea, because guess why? Don't answer that, you'll get it wrong. Oh, so dumb. You're just a dumb little man who tries to destroy this school every minute. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's episode 336. First week of May 2023, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we can't talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. That's right, we both went to AEW Dynamite this week. Mm -hmm. Did you have a good time? Yeah, I mean, I... I've, I I always say uh, it's nearly impossible uh, to have a bad time at a live wrestling show, whether you've been to a hundred shows, whether you're not even a fan and you go. <laughs> I think live wrestling, te- tell it like te- weekly TV show wrestling, maybe not not as fun as like a house show or a pay per view or something, but it's real hard to have a bad time at a show like that. So yeah, I had a I had a good enough time. So they did uh, AEW Dark and AEW Dark Elevation are dead. Mm-hmm. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Um, but they still they did two dark matches before uh, Dynamite. And then we did Dynamite. Then they taped Rampage, and then we all went home. I've definitely been at longer AEW tapings, so that wasn't uh, a pleasant experience. Yeah, there was a there was a lot less uh, faffing about than I would say the last couple of times they taped in the uh, in the Baltimore area. There was uh, pretty much just as soon as Dynamite went off the air, they changed the ring ring aprons and got the people out there and did their matches. And then on top of this, this was like a truncated live ramp, live portion or, or arena portion of Rampage because they have the pre-recorded the, the cinematic Hardy Boys thing on mm. on this week's show. So we only I mean the actual wrestling on the show in the arena was was also kept pretty short and yeah, that was it. Uh it was uh it was uh like I said a very I thought a very very easy to watch and enjoy show. A few things. There is still way too much downtime <laughs> at at these tapings. The uh, rampage didn't begin to like the uh, ten thirteen or something, mm-hmm. and like, why does it take thir- Why why does it take so dang long to change the ring skirts? Like, I don't need thirteen minutes of Justin Roberts trying out his improv. All also, Justin Roberts, his patter is the worst. He doesn't even try. <laughs> he doesn't have material prepared. Mm-mm. He is just like anybody in section 106 named Greg. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, I- I'm not even making that up. <laughs> no, it's, it's about that level. He says stuff like that. He looks around, he reads some of the crowd signs, and then he'll be like, Hey, we're going to DC next month. Anybody uh, from DC? <laughs> Like six people will cheer and he'll be like, all right, great. <laughs> this is our cameraman, Greg. <laughs> this is our He's other cameraman, from... Kevin. <laughs> One of them is from Baltimore. One of them is not from Baltimore. Right. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> like, you... at, I was going to say, they just played they, before, right before, like the 10 minutes before the last dark match and Dynamite going live, they just played videos. I was like, I would have preferred that to Justin Roberts. Uh, trying out his his tight his tight eight minute set on us. His his pattern is the worst, and not only that, he got COVID a couple weeks ago, and Dasha filled in for him. And every time Dasha fills in for him, as you like to point out, she totally outclasses him at his <laughs> job. So not only is he extremely problematic mm-hmm. in terms of sending direct messages to underage children, allegedly. But also, he's not even the best ring announcer that they have under contract. Yeah, it's, it's a real mystery. Like, like Dasha 
I know Dasha wears a lot of hats because she does like Spanish commentary and she does backstage stuff and she does whatever else. Yeah. So may- so maybe she can't be the full time ring announcer, but she got to be able to find <laughs> somebody else. Go get Lillian Garcia out of retirement. She is, um, do you know, she uh, she got divorced. It's just sad. Of course, I didn't know that. <laughs> And uh, she's really into singing uh, in her praise and worship band at her church. Oh, well, hey, it's important to have hobbies and, and a, a community around you in the uh, after such a big life uh, change. <laughs> yeah, Lillian's all right with me. Got a lot of time for her. <laughs> I do. All right. So uh, that was uh, EW Dynamite Live <laughs> and your Lillian Garcia life update. Um, let's see here. Um, a little bit more on AEW Live. They refurbished the worst arena in the country, the CFG Bank Arena. It's the old Baltimore Civic Center, the old Baltimore Arena, the old First Mariner Arena, the old Royal Farms Arena. It's got a new paint of coat, Mm -hmm. and uh, they put a new ceiling in, and they put a new sound system in. And uh, they improved the worst concession experience in America. (laughs) So it's only one of the worst concessions experiences in America. And a lot of it is self-serve now. So that's nice. And um, let's see what else we got here on the EW Live. Um, I watched the show back on TV and liked the in-ring a lot better on TV than I did in the building. I don't know what what that's <laughs> for. Uh I thought the four pillars match was good. Mm-hmm. I think Orange Cassidy had has the best match on the show every week. Yeah. <laughs> and he was in an eight man here and probably did so again. And um I thought that was a Soraya's mm, Soraya's Soraya's um Best match since she's been back against Willow. Mm-hmm. What do you think of all those three? Uh, yeah, I I thought the opener on the show, the Eight Man, was just just a whole lot of fun. Um, obviously it's Roddy's first match. He didn't they didn't make this like a showcase match for Roddy though, even though it was his first match in the company. Um, if anyone, it was more of a showcase for Bandito. It felt like, which you know, Bandito's great, so I'm not complaining about that. But yeah, everybody got to shine and they had a fun match. And then uh, and then they did the the post match brawl with Adam Cole and and Jericho. Um, So, yeah, I thought it was I thought that was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I thought the main event was really fun. First, I guess. No, I we saw MJF wrestle live at the first Dynamite in D.C., but it was like a two second squash. Um, So this is my first time seeing MJF have a real match in person. And he strikes me as a guy whose shtick works better when you're in the building for it. Like they definitely definitely, plays to the back row as far as like facial expressions and stuff. They definitely worked that for the people in the building. It was like a house show match in that there were spots designed to get ha ha's from the crowd. (laughs) Right. Yes, there's a lot of uh, over the top. Uh, lo- it's always very entertaining when when two heels are just showering each other with physical affection. Yes. Um, and they and he what? and Sammy were. Oh <laughs> uh, no! Just gonna let it ride. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sam, Sammy, and MJF, I thought were very entertaining as that duo, and people were really into Darby and Jungle Boy, so that helped too. Yeah, and it's. It's one of those things where, and we can talk about it in a minute, I think maybe the viewership reflects that everybody knew what the finish was, I think. I think everybody figured Sammy's getting pinned and it's going to be a four-way. Um, so I don't know that there was a lot of drama where people believed that uh, that Jungle Jack and, and Darby were going to lose. But yeah, it was, a, it was a fun, a very fun match to watch in the building. And uh, yeah, I thought the the uh, the women's match was fun. Um, they did what <laughs> I guess this sort of thing happens all the time in pro wrestling. 
but they did a bit. They brought Sheeta back. She hasn't been on TV in months. Um, and I know she was out of the country for part of this, but I think she's been back for a while and just hanging out. Um, so they brought her back. Everybody cheers. Uh, and then they tease that she's going to join the outcasts. And then uh, it's a trap and the outcasts turn their backs and Jamie and Britt get in the ring and then uh, and then Sheeta beats beats everybody's ass with a with a kendo stick. By the way, maybe Sheeta should have joined the Outcasts because then she could have given good kendo stick shots in that angle with Britt a couple of weeks ago because she wailed on these on these poor girls. Um, but yeah, that was fun, and I think it's like we we happen to catch AEW Dynamite in a week where. Um, we get like the little microcosms of advancement in these storylines that have largely, <laughs> largely been kind of spinning their wheels for a while. Like, I think we've had an idea of the direction for the most part of the next pay-per-view for a while. And so we caught them, you know, actually making the main event of the pay-per-view official. We caught them with Sheeta returning after like 16 straight weeks of either the outcasts win a match and then the baby faces run them off or the baby faces win a match and then the outcasts come down and lay them out. Uh, we finally like, okay, she back. We've got like a full trio of, uh, of originals to go after the three, three outcasts now. So we caught, we caught AEW on a week of like actual storyline advancement. So that's probably a bonus still. I guess, I guess we're still uh, three weeks out from the pay-per-view, but, we have the main event for that show and that's it. And then uh, two weeks before and the week of the show, they'll just they'll announce 14 other matches for it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that. The big news with AEW this week, they've sold 50,000 plus tickets for Wembley Stadium in London, in foggy London town. <laughs> they've sold 50,000 plus tickets for all in in a pre-sale, this is an impressive number, even if everyone on the internet is losing their mind about it in one way or another. <laughs> I I I don't know what to say. Congratulations to them. Uh that's an, an impressive number. Um I didn't I thought they that this was the baseline for what they would sell. Mm-hmm. I think I wouldn't be shocked if they sell another 35,000 and sell it out. That'd be great. Good for them. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a market they've never been in before. They're obviously going to market it as a big time event show. So you'll also get people traveling, people from not only from the US, but also, you know, people in, you know, Scotland and Wales and any anywhere close. Anywhere close, I'm sure, will are willing to uh, to put in for that so like it's a it's a great it's a great yeah it's really cool it'll be a a really cool show and yeah i don't i don't know i yeah i thought about 50 55 000 was was maybe what we were gonna get and obviously they've already gotten near that number so when the actual on sale goes on sale over the weekend will will they move another 30,000 tickets or whatever maybe uh but if not hey 50,000 people ain't ain't nothing to sneeze at either so yeah it's it's good it's good for wrestling that another uh, that another company besides WWE can fill up a stadium even though again it's again it's a perfect storm of them being in a new market for the first time and doing a big event show you obviously can't do this all the time but it's exciting. So, yeah, good good for them. A lot of speculation that this is going to be um, on the Max streaming service, I and mean, it's going to be like noon on a Saturday or something. So, or I forget, is the date a Saturday or Sunday? I thought it was a Sunday, but I haven't double-checked that. The word is that it's going to be on the... Uh, Max, formerly HBO Max, let's make it worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, streaming service. Um, it is a Sunday, 
but uh, I think it's going to be noon Eastern time. So that's fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, look, the show's going to go three and a half, four hours like all their shows do. I would prefer it start at noon. <laughs> well, that's a fair point. Rather than 8 p.m. Eastern, as they usually do. That is a fair point. Um, Nothing really new on the uh, Saturday Night Collision program. Uh, other than it's it's happening. No. And no. the messiest bitch in wrestling did make an appearance at Impact over the weekend, but <laughs> CM Punk went and played Uno mm-hmm. with his friends at at Impact and mm-hmm. uh sat with Mercedes in the crowd and uh, and watched Trinity uh debut for Impact. Yeah, I didn't I didn't realize he was such good friends with uh with Mercedes and Trinity. That's very cool. I mean I knew they had like, you know, he had t- given like sort of public support to them last year when everything went down. But yeah, uh, I I, I don't get the impression that they're like uh, going out for coffee and stuff. mm -hmm. But hey, you know, he gave (laughs) us uh, I I'm vaguely implying (laughs) that he did this for clout, but (laughs) (laughs) but hey, he put his money where his mouth is. He publicly supported them verbally last year. And he showed up to physically support them. Obviously, Impact was taping in Chicago. It's not like he <laughs> flew to Nashville or something to to be there for. Her. But yes, it's it's nice that he went, and he didn't have to. So that's that's the positive way of looking at that. <laughs> Thank you for spelling out what you were implying, because honestly, I couldn't tell if you were implying that he was doing it for clout or you're implying that um, he. Um, is trying to sleep with one of them. Yes. Yeah, no, that, that was not what I was implying. I mean, okay. I mean, do we know Phil Brooks to be uh <laughs> do we know Phil Brooks to be a, a bit of a hound dog? I have known CM Punk <laughs> since the early two thousands. Um no, he's a, he's an old married man now. The yeah, the connection sure. there too is that of course his wife is close with Pam. Mm-hmm. And Pam is close with mercedes and trinity so there's it's like by they're adopted friends by marriage sure sure all right yeah so that's this week's cm punk update (laughs) he um he's doing live play-by-play of uh nhl hockey playoffs on his instagram stories all week also which is uh entertaining to him i suppose right let's see wwe they have a pay-per-view this saturday from beautiful puerto rico um they had their draft Mm -hmm. this um the end of last week and beginning of this week they called up a total of 18 wrestlers from nxt Mm -hmm. um They are, I think we touched on this last week, they are introducing a World Heavyweight Championship. Mm -hmm. Um, Cody's going to be on the brand with the fake world title. (laughs) And uh, after teasing, breaking up tag teams, and even breaking up the the bloodline, they did none of those things. And uh, the bloodline all stays on SmackDown. So, hooray. This was not the most earth shattering uh, draft they've ever done. No, I think especially because we know the policy, like like the raw champ, the raw women's champion got drafted to SmackDown and vice versa. So they're just going to hand each other the belts. Yes, um, on television, and it'll why, stuck. But, why do they insist on doing this? Uh, I don't know. Um, why? Why? <laughs> and this is not. I'm sure a million people have pointed this out, but why don't you call those belts something else? And then you don't have to do a little exchange every year when you draft the champions to opposite shows. Yes. Why don't you call them the women's universal championship and whatever? Yes. You know, then you don't have to do this every year, but and it's the same thing with the tag belts. Although currently the tag belts are both on, you know, one tag team. team so yeah. will that continue will they get stripped of one because they're 
Sammy and Kevin are raw people, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So will they will they get stripped of the SmackDown belts and they'll we'll do a, a, a fun little tournament of like whatever four teams are on SmackDown currently to crown new champions? Who knows? Uh, the possibilities are quite limited um, <laughs> based on who books the shows. But hey, you could that, that's that's the other part of this. That's like, yeah, other than that, all the NXT call ups are. I guess kind of exciting in a sense of a lot. It was a lot of people that have been down there for a while and it feels like it's time to fish or get off the pot. Like how, how much longer are, what? are we going to let <laughs> that's not the, I was going to say Fisher cut bait, but I got, <laughs> I got scrambled up in my head. I liked it. All right. Anywho. Um, <laughs> and uh, to fish, fish, or get off the pot. <laughs> As you know, <laughs> we all fish sitting on toilets. <laughs> You know, in a way we are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Metaphorically speaking. Sure. But it's like, yeah, how how long are you gonna, how long are you gonna keep uh Casey Cat and Zero and uh and people that have been down there for like six years? Right. Like in you know, Indy Hartwell, whoever else got called up, uh people that have been not, Zion Quinn. Right. Just people <laughs> that have been there for an eternity. So call yes. them up, see if they've got anything, try to find a role for them. And, you know, let's let's see what this world class performance center can do after training all of these people for 18, you know, 18 months to four years or whatever. Yes, to your point, this was, in fact, very much a. um, A. Let's see what we have. (laughs) Draft. (laughs) Sort of a, a 2020 or Baltimore Orioles season. <laughs> Let's see what we've got in the farm system before we start just selling. We've already sold off everything that we can. Let's uh, let's see. Let's just see what we got in the farm system now while we while we attempt to rebuild it. Sure. Very much sink or swim. And uh, let's see. So the free agents coming out of this draft, which I assume just means we're going to send you to whichever show we want to do jobs. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the exception of a couple names, yes. The exception of one name, I think. I mean, almost not doing a lot of jobs. Well, I guess that's true. That's true. But the free agents here are Baron Corbin, who has won one match all year on a house <laughs> show. Brock, as we mentioned, no jobs. Cedric and Shelton, jobber tag team. Mm-hmm. Dolph Ziggler, jobber. Elias, jobber. Mustafa Ali, jobber. Omas, as you mentioned, not doing a lot of jobs. Von Wagner, tall, jobber. <laughs> Zion Quinn, tall, jobber. So there we go with that. Um, And uh, yeah. Cameron Grimes is out of purgatory. He's on his way. Um, Zoe Stark, kind of the exception to the uh, sink or swim in that they think she's a really good worker. I don't disagree. And um, yeah, we'll we'll see. We'll see what we got here. Mm-hmm. If you were not drafted, if you are Alexa Bliss, Aaliyah, Bray Wyatt, Captain Howdy, um, <laughs> Randy Orton, Bobby Roode, Shanky, Skyscrape and Shanky, mm-hmm. uh, Champa. Um, I don't know how I would take this. We've been speculating for a while that there's a round of layoffs coming up. I don't know that they'll do it. Um, I've been expecting them on a Thursday night. Anytime since WrestleMania now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just have the earnings call this week, right? Correct. So it's usually this week <laughs> that it happens. Yes. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. We shall see. We shall, in fact, see. But that's what's going on there with uh, WWE draft backlash this Saturday night from Puerto Rico. Bad Bunny versus Damian Priest in a San Juan street fight. They'll gimmick it up. Bad Bunny will win, I hope. Uh, Bianca Belair versus Io Sky for the Raw Women's title. That should be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should be awesome. 
Austin Theory versus Bob Lashley versus Bronson Reed. Bronson Reed, um, I would uh, change my phone number. <laughs> Adopt the JTG approach. Don't answer your phone or change your phone number. Yes. <laughs> um, Seth freaking Rollins versus Omos. Ooh, boy. Well, I think we got Rowl- we to heat o- up Omos so that he can wrestle Roman in Saudi Arabia. There is that. There is also Seth is the logically the guy who should win the World Heavyweight Championship uh, based on who's on the Raw brand and et cetera, et cetera. So, but here's the wild card here is that Vince is back. And so he could squash Seth here. And then have him win one match on Raw on Monday, and think that he'll he's rehabbed him, and he'll go on to win the title at in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the end of the month. That's right. That seems pretty likely, honestly. <laughs> oh, we sitting here booking the territory, doing a pretty good job of it. <laughs> Rhea Ripley versus Zelina Vega. Zelina is of Puerto Rican heritage, and will wrestle for the title in Puerto Rico. Um, this, I, I would like to see them work this like, uh, an old school big person versus a little person match. Yeah. I'm, I'm not necessarily talking, sorry, I don't mean to cut you out. I'll let you speak in a moment, but, uh, I, and I, I'm not necessarily talking about like, uh, King Kong Bundy versus, uh, the Haiti kid at WrestleMania three. <laughs> You'd like to see, like, uh, you know, some shine and a comeback from the baby face. That's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. More like that. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Like, I, like, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure they'll do everything. They'll pull out all the stops to do something memorable for that. <laughs> but I, yeah, I don't, I don't like uh, I don't like Zelina's chances, even if even if they weren't in her hometown. But hey, theoretically, you know. This could elevate her. It would perhaps help if, like, she ever won a match on television. <laughs> yeah. Before, like, I think she won a tag match, like, in the last month. But, like, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you could. This is this is very old school wrestling, and not not the stories that we tell on WWE television. But uh, yeah, maybe if someone's gonna go for the title at the next show, you could uh, give them like three or four wins the month before. Let but me. Uh, I'm looking at um, Selena's cage match profile here, mm-hmm. and first of all, this is fascinating. <laughs> this woman was in TNA. Would you care to guess how old she is? I guess in her, she has to be in her 30s by now, right? She's only 32. Wow, <laughs> she was in TNA in like 2010. <laughs> Yeah, a long time ago. That's what I'm, I'm kind of getting at here. All right. Her uh, her match is here in 2023. She lost to Candice LeRae at a house show. Mm-hmm. She lost to Candice LeRae at a house show the next night. <laughs> she was three weeks later. She was in the Royal Rumble. Lost that. Mm-hmm. First week of February, she lost a four way elimination chamber qualifying match. Um, doesn't wrestle for six weeks on St. Paddy's Day. She and Santos Escobar lose a mixed tag match to Dom and Rhea. Mm-hmm. She doesn't wrestle for five more weeks. She wrestles on the April 28th SmackDown, beats Sonya Deville, her first win of the year. Okay. <laughs> and then on the following Raw, the May 1st Raw, uh, she lost in a mixed tag match where. Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and Rhea Ripley beat Rey Mysterio, Santos Escobar, and Selena Vega in a mixed six-person match. So she has one win this calendar year. (laughs) Really, really heating up that challenger. And if we go back even further, before that, the last time she won a match (laughs) was... Not in 2022. <laughs> well, I, I remember when she came back after 
tweeting that she supported unions. Yeah. Uh, she did nothing but job for like a solid six months. But then I, I, I kind of lost track at that point because who could possibly care? Right. Well, she won the women's tag titles with Carmella at some point. Um, you say she, so. Yeah. She won one match in t- 2022. <laughs> And it was on January 3rd. <laughs> wow. She did not win a match the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. That's great. All right. And then the main event of the show, I guess, is the... Um, gosh, they got to put Cody and Brock on last, right? Because... I, the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they... But... If Ray, if Ray was in the Bad Bunny match and it was a tag, I would say put that on last sure but since it's just bad bunny and i'm sure ray and the lwo and everybody will get involved in in that it'll be a lot of gaga but yeah i think i think the actual <laughs> main event of this show is the uh the american nightmare and uh and and the cowboy the, the last outlaw brock lesnar but because they've been positioning this trios match with riddle kevin owens and Sami Zayn against <laughs> Solo Sokoa and the Usos as the actual main event. That's oh, the, right. <laughs> the final match here in the list. But, like, that's a TV. They Trios matches are TV matches to them. They don't headline mm-hmm. pay per views with that. I'm like, what are we right, doing? Roman's here? not even in it. <laughs> right. I, I, don't, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. Is it as evident to you as it is to a lot of pundits that Vince McMahon? fingerprints are all over this program again (laughs) yeah it doesn't feel like it every week like but then there are weeks where like they make a bunch of rules about the draft and how everyone's going to be drafted like we talked about and everyone everyone's getting drafted and tag teams can be broken up and everything and then none of that happens and also there's a bunch of people that don't get drafted that can go to both shows (laughs) um or or they say that the world title is going to be decided between superstars from both brands. And then now it's just a raw championship and Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman cuts a promo saying that Roman Reigns should be able to challenge for that title as well, but he can't because he's on SmackDown. So yeah, I mean, in that way (laughs) it does. I don't think like the overall, and, and I guess in the sense that it's a lot of the same, you know, it's, it's the same people on the same show every week. Right. But that, you know, outside of this, like three, I think this three month mania build kind of ruined, (laughs) ruined everybody's memory of what the shows largely were under, under Paul from August to December, which was glacial pace. (laughs) And a lot of the same matches or variations on the same matches over and over again. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely stuff as far as changing their minds on on that kind of stuff that that feels like Vince stuff and, you know, a potential increased push for people like Omos after he was kind of <laughs> seemingly pushed down a little bit after, you know, after Vince was out of power. Yeah. So th- there's definitely those those types of things that that feel like there's a little bit more uh, of Vince's fingerprints on the show. All right, uh, tying up some odds and ends here. You mentioned AW Dynamite viewership. We don't do a lot of ratings talk on this show because you can go literally anywhere else and get that kind of thing. But Dynamite did do their lowest total viewership of the year with this week's episode. But the 18 to 49 number is the same number that it's been for the la- the previous one to three weeks. And... uh. Four of the last five weeks. So the young the young folks who still watch television um, are very. They watch this program, the same number of people, 18 to 49, watch this program. Pretty much every week, and the numbers that fluctuate are uh, older folks, I think, is my takeaway from. And it always starts, generally, the first segment is the highest rated. It drops 9 o'clock, sometimes it gets people back, and then it drops. 
I, I don't think you can glean a whole lot from looking at Dynamite viewer patterns week after week because it's the same. But anyway, yeah. any thoughts on Dynamite viewership? Yeah, I mean, like you said, like if you when you when you look when you get to see the quarter hours and stuff, I mean, even that data can be a little bit misleading because if there's a commercial break, sometimes there's two commercial breaks in one quarter. And like, of course, that quarter is going to crater. So you go, oh, nobody wants to watch, you know, the Lucha Brothers because their their quarter hour lost 100,000 people or whatever. It's like, well, if you look at it, that might not actually be the reason. Right. But um. But yeah, I mean, you 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 can see little upticks when like MJF's on the show, or usually when you know the elite or, or well, actually now the elite had the opposite problem for a while there. <laughs> well, the elite BCC stuff I think has done decently well. Generally, Orange Cassidy does well. Mm-hmm. Um, Moxley does okay. MJF does does good does well, and uh, the elite don't do so well, and the women's segments don't do so well. Is it because right. they always put the elite on in the nine o'clock hour and they always put the women on at, at nine fifteen? I don't know. <laughs> or or is it people are less interested in those stories? I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah, like you said, it's it's hard to gleam a lot of patterns. Like I said, you can see little upticks or you can see downturns, and it you know, a lot of times it, it could be the people in the segments, or it could just be where they're placed in the show. What kind of ads there were? Was there a video package that ran before they came out that was, you know, that bled into their quarter or whatever? Like there's, there's could be any number of a thousand things, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's a plus for them though, is that the, 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 the desirable demo is not fluctuating as wildly as the total viewership is like it, it would be worse if both numbers were down. (laughs) that much so like yeah it's i i don't think the sky is falling i think obviously you can make an argument that it's just it's just not that hot of a show and maybe people dvr it maybe people just kept catch up on youtube clips or or who knows but it yeah for whatever reason live viewership with people over a certain age is fluctuating a lot more wildly and is going down a lot more frequently uh, than than it was say a year ago. All right, New Japan Pro Wrestling. They brought back Yoda Suji from Excursion. He was a guy we've only ever seen do jobs because he was a young lion, mm-hmm. and he is a Japanese American football player. <laughs> so he did like uh, he did some cool tackles, and he did a started doing a splash. And uh, then he went on an excursion for a year, and now he's back, and they brought him back in the main event. He he will be not only the main event, the main event of like their third biggest show of the year. (laughs) That's the wild part to me. This isn't Dontaku or like on the undercard of a best of the super juniors or something. Right. He's challenging Sonata for the IWGP World Heavyweight title at Dominion in Osaka Joe Hall on sunday june 4th so hey they do need fresh blood in main events true and it's joined lij so i mean it's probably good that somebody whose knees aren't <laughs> held together with tape uh maybe gets the main events for a while so we'll see yeah that's cool uh david finley won the never title and he's defending against el phantasmo do not care <laughs> maybe uh, face el phantasmo i don't I don't get like he's such his strength is how annoying he is, right? Like, correct, correct. He's the most annoying man you've ever seen. Like, who wants to yes. cheer this? It's like turning Sammy Guevara baby face. Yes, like maybe it'll idea. work for a little bit, but eventually <laughs> people are going to remember. Oh wait, this guy sucks. Not as a wrestler, but as you know, as a personality. <laughs> yes, because he has a terrible personality. Yes. Uh. Aussie opener defending um, the IWGP tag titles against evil, Yujiro, evil and Yujiro, Yujiro Takahashi and Hiroki Goto and Yoshiashi. That's just that's a, a filler filler on the card there. Moxley's going to be on the show. Moxley's also going to be wrestling on their Los Angeles show on May the 21st. So Moxley... Warming up for uh, 
taking some New Japan dates as we head into the summer here. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So he's he's doing a six man with Shota at on his Japan date. And you'd have to wonder if, say, he wrestles for the never open weight six man belts. Is that does that set up like him versus Okada in a singles at Forbidden Door? Because that's or or would New Japan do that on a cross branded show, or would they want to save that for one of their shows? <laughs> this is where the cross promotional stuff starts to get a little bit hairy. I think when. Because like that's a match they didn't do on really on Moxley's first big excursion in Japan, so I'm yeah. sure that's one they want to do. But who's gonna lose? Where's the match gonna take place? Like this is this is where the you know some of the red tape starts coming in when it's multiple companies working together in different countries, <laughs> right? So they put the they put the six man uh, tag titles on Okada Tanahashi and Ishii. Um, the lads, yes, naturally. Um, and they haven't officially announced Moxley is going to be challenging for the six man. That was more announcer speculation. Okay. Um, but I mean, I'm sure that's informed speculation. So you're probably right. And then ultimately, that's what they're going to do. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. G1 season is is interesting to me. Um, we're going to find out. Which guys, if any, Tony is going to let work the G1 this year? Mm-hmm. It's a big summer for AEW. I wouldn't want my guys working the G1, but I'm sure Moxley, perhaps, definitely, excuse me, definitely Danielson mm-hmm. want to work the G1. So interesting. Also on Dominion is uh, Jeff Cobb versus Zack Sabre Jr. in a 15 minute time limit match for the <laughs> uh, for the TV title. It's where those cool. guys can really shine. <laughs> also, uh, Tanahashi or Osprey. I'm sure it'll be Osprey versus Lance Archer um, to decide who wrestles Omega at Forbidden Door. So, they cool. had a great match. Ta- uh, Osprey and Archer had a great match in Dallas, Dallas? At, at the G1 like f- six years ago. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't. Ar- I don't did know Archer what... win that. I think he did because they were in Texas. So I think they gave him the big win. Yeah, I think so. Damnedest thing I ever saw. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, let's see here. Um, any thoughts in wrapping up? Any thoughts on uh, Jeff Jarrett uh, working on the Briscoe farm from Dynamite this week? We we did bury the lead here because <laughs> <laughs> the best part of Dynamite this week was not anything that happened in the arena. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It was it was Jeff Jarrett and and Satnam Singh wearing no shirt and a pair of coveralls. <laughs> yes, dancing around with uh, Mark Briscoe's baby son. <laughs> yes, <laughs> while Papa Briscoe warned <laughs> warned Mark Briscoe against uh, against uh, trusting any of these these uh, these yes. idiots. Absolutely yes. amazing. <laughs> oh. Papa Briscoe got in the ring after the show. I don't know if you hung around for the post match promo, but Mark cut a little promo. I did not stick around for the promo. I saw the family getting in the ring as I Yeah, was there up. were about three dozen Briscoes that got in the ring. It was like <laughs> going to an old Ring of Honor taping at the Duburns Arena. <laughs> that does I was gonna say the last couple times uh, Dynamite came to town, they were very uh, ROH pilled shows. Oh yeah. Much to the detriment <laughs> of uh, <laughs> I think what a lot of people came to see. Yes. Um, but uh, but in this case, that 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 was very nice. That that is one thing I'll say. This Mark Briscoe match with uh, Pero Pelagroso, <laughs> Preston Vance, <laughs> Preston Vance. Yes. Uh, what it really made me think. This is like the least insightful thing I've ever said on the show. But gosh, dang it, Mark Briscoe is a fantastic baby face, isn't he? <laughs> like, <laughs> Like I'm just watching this guy. The crowd's tired. Like half the people have left because it's the last match of a, you know, a show that's gone over three hours. If you got, you know, if you got there at seven when they said the show was starting, even though it didn't start till seven thirty, right? Um, it's like people are tired, and he's just working, and he's just playing to the crowd, and he's getting people into it, and he's getting them into the comeback, and he's teasing like the, you know, keeps going for the J driller, and he gets countered and everything. It's like he's fantastic. <laughs> like Mark, yeah 
what a what a revelation I'm having here in the year of 2023. Mark Briscoe is a great wrestler, but I, I was mean, we haven't seen a ton of Mark Briscoe singles matches, you know, at least in the last decade. I guess they split them up and turned Jay heel when Jay was world champion in Ring of Honor about 10 mm-hmm. years ago. But yeah, it was just it was just nice to see. And it was nice to see the crowd come alive for him, too, I think. Yeah, they had somewhere in the neighborhood of. 4,000 to 4,500 people there, allegedly. Mm-hmm. Um, they sold no upper deck tickets, and they basically sold the non-hard camera side. Like, it looked fine on TV, but mm-hmm. like, like they were only shooting half the building on TV, and the upper deck was totally dark. So, I, I don't know what I expected uh, attendance-wise, but... Um, a little light, I would say, but they... yeah, I think I think it it outdrew the last dynamite in October, but was less than the first dynamite they ran in Baltimore about, like a year ago. Yeah, it was like a year ago this week, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they sent. I guess the Orioles were out of town, so they sent a bunch of wrestlers to the Washington Nationals game on Tuesday night to do like local promotion to try to get it's like and you can tell you can just tell sometimes who understands this market and who doesn't Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like mm, I guess it's better than nothing if you're trying to get uh, some last minute local publicity to send guys to a baseball game uh, you know in in Washington DC 65 minutes down the road (laughs) <laughs> but also, we are separate markets, and I don't think they understand that. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> and they're also coming. They're coming to Washington, D.C. next month. Yeah, that was the other thing, too. When they announced that uh, we got our rah-rah speech from Tony Khan right before the show went on the air. And uh, and he was talking about, oh, we'll be in D.C. next month. And I'm like, why? Why would you do D.C. and Baltimore so close together? Like usually it's WWE comes to town, they do one or the other. Like Right. And then the next time maybe they do the other one. But Right. Yeah. yeah. So but that's I guess they just what buildings are available when. And that's maybe the other the other secret headline that nobody talks about <laughs> is that AEW can apparently book the big arenas in cities again after some of them anyway, after maybe being secretly blackballed, which is why they were running a college arena the last few times in Baltimore and why they were running wherever they were running in DC. Uh, Yeah, they were definitely Baltimore could have been weird because um, the main arena was closed for uh, renovations. Sure. But the the two dynamites they ran here last year, they did run um, at a college in the suburbs and DC, the last two times they were here, they ran um, not downtown DC. They ran at a small sports arena. And they're back in the NBA arena when they're here next month. So, yeah, I'm typically in a market, they've been running the B buildings. And as you point out, now they're running the A buildings. So that's interesting. Mm-hmm. And it's not like, I mean, Raw's coming to Baltimore in like two months, too. So yeah, Rob will be here in July. Yeah. In the same building. So I don't yeah, I just I just thought that was interesting after yeah. <laughs> seemingly them being at, maybe double J. That was that's my theory is that since they brought on double double J as president of live events or whatever his title is, uh he'll yeah. be running he'll be running the company in a couple of years. But <laughs> for now he's president of live events. Maybe he uh smooths some things over. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, you get more of a track record, you get a few years behind you, you got a little more clout, you can go to guys and say, look, you can't strong arm us out of <laughs> out of these buildings. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, that's interesting stuff. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to touch on here? No, I think we've uh, we've run the gamut. And, uh, and just a programming note, Backlash is on Saturday, <laughs> which I yes. did not know until we were about <laughs> to start this show. Saturday at 8 p.m. Yeah, I think. And then on uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, the uh, United Champions show is on a Saturday at like noon. <laughs> oh, right. Because that's the, the Saudi. 
Right. And then that Sunday, um, we'll have Double or Nothing and some NXT show head to head. Oh, what a coincidence that NXT picked that date to run a show. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. we didn't talk about NXT. I watch NXT. I have not watched this week's NXT yet, actually. So it's probably a good reason not to talk about it. All right. <laughs> they drafted all the champions. <laughs> or a lot they drafted of drafted half the champions. Yeah. yeah. The women's tag champions. Uh, the women's champion, Indies, vacating her title. Uh, but the women's tag champs are just taking this belt to SmackDown, I guess. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, sure. Why not? All right. Uh, until next time, everybody. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We will be back very soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. So, uh, Lamar Jackson signed his extension. All right. It's no longer in principle, I see. Right. I, uh, you know... I was tired of it. I was ready to uh, say it's time to start. Why are we zigging when everyone else is zagging in terms of running an offense built around running the ball (laughs) when (laughs) every other team in the league just drops back and throws it uh, on every down? Mm -hmm. And we're the only team that runs like an offense from the 1940s (laughs) with a fullback and three tight ends and pulling guards and pulling tackles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, I think some of that was going to change anyway with Greg Roman not here. And I don't begrudge Greg Roman. He was given (laughs) an impossible task. (laughs) Take a quarterback who is not good at throwing (laughs) and build an offense around him. And they made it like, you know, they broke records for running the ball that hadn't been set since the 40s and 50s. But, uh, yeah, Lamar's back. Now that he's back in the fold, I am uh, I am glad I am so I could throw babies in the air and um, <laughs> and kiss string- strangers on the cheek. <laughs> and um, I, I don't even really know what I'm saying. But <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy Lamar's back. Five years, no trade clause. And no franchise tag clause. So we'll never have to go through this again. <laughs> hey, but the Baltimore Orioles are 21 and 10. That's right. They have the third best record in baseball, I believe. I believe that is correct. Yes. Um, Still yeah. the Pirates and Rays are just the only ones better than us. Uh, winning percentage wise, we're better than the Pirates. Okay. Uh, the Braves and Rays are better. Okay. And we're, 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 we have this, the third best record in baseball and are four and a half games out of first place because the Rays are doing things that no one has ever seen before. <laughs> Isn't that the Rays? The Rays are 26 and six. Unbelievable. <laughs> I, uh, I put the, the Orioles game on this afternoon as I was, uh, getting my beauty rest and, uh, <laughs> I saw Jordan Lyles pitching for the Royals and he gave up eight runs <laughs> in the first two innings. And I thought, well, this is pretty much in the bag. No, nope, it was actually close. 13 to 10, the final <laughs> score. <laughs> Whew, so uh, yeah, what's uh, what's still in Tate? <laughs> Hopefully back soon. <laughs> Michael Givens, our, our one big uh, free agent signing. Yeah, hopefully back soon. All right. Because, yeah. <laughs> Well, we... hey, the back end of the bullpen's been tremendous with Cano and Batista True. and Brian freaking Baker. I know. It's like we're living on such a lightning bolt. <laughs> <laughs> yep. When we send Brian Baker out for the seventh, but he, he's delivered so far. It's like even like, I mean, until he, I mean, they've gotten knocked around a little bit more this week, but like they had that, whatever it was, 20 inning scoreless streak or whatever. Yes. They were. Everybody was pitching well, like Voth and and Ake and everybody were starting, seemingly were starting to come together. And then things got a little bit out of hand. 
<laughs> in the last yeah. week or so. But yeah, even even uh, Mike Bauman, who mm-hmm. um, converted starter, who's mm-hmm. kind of co long reliever with uh, Austin Voth. Um, his numbers are good. Mm-hmm. It's it's really both Keegan Aiken and CNL Perez who, if the starter can't go six, those guys are a problem. Yeah, <laughs> the CNL Perez has pretty consistently been a problem since they cracked down on sticky stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, well, I'm not accusing him of anything. It's just an observation. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh... A lot of reason to be optimistic about the Baltimore Orioles. Yeah, and it feels like yeah, they're <laughs> they're good. <laughs> like, like there's there's holes which we've just spent minutes talking about, but it's yes. like, no, I I think they can win <laughs> every night. All right. Uh by the way, uh the pitch clock, mm-hmm. I'm now in favor of it. Okay. These games are so much more watchable. The innings are like lightning now to me. Like, <laughs> yes, when no one can just endlessly stall, mm-hmm. it's it's so much more enjoyable. And I didn't think that it bothered me, and uh, thought I had the attention span to sit through playoff baseball games, which can be a, such a drag. <laughs> but. The uh yeah the um the uh the the pitch clock massive improvement so much more watchable as a as a product yeah and it also just feels like yeah I think like the great relievers are the great relievers but it does make things more exciting also because hey they don't you know they don't get to sit there for forty five seconds before throwing <laughs> throwing a pitch like they whether they're ready or not they got to throw <laughs> right. And then you're creating more, which if that is the point to create more contact, create more excitement in in each inning, then it's working. And uh, like I like that games are two and a half hours instead of three and a half now. Like that's yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yes. Also, the this is the thing too that we when they put the uh, they added the ghost runner in extra innings. Mm-hmm. Everybody was just like concentrating on the all oh, they just you just put a ghost runner on. Nobody thought about any of the strategic implications. Mm-hmm. It's like now with the pitch clock. Did you see the one this week where uh the guy, the pitcher held until one on the pitch clock? And so the runner on second base started taking off for third because it's like, well, the pitch clock's at one, he's gotta throw it. But mm-hmm. instead of throwing it, he picked he Ooh. St- he turned and picked the guy. No, I it's missed like, that. There's strategic elements to this pitch clock thing that make the game interesting too. Right. It's not all in the favor of the batter necessarily. Yes. I try to keep on keeping on.